Brasil vai conversar hoje com o economista colombiano Daniel Gomes, que chefia o departamento de pesquisa sobre competitividade no Fórum Econômico Mundial. O Daniel tem um doutorado em economia da Universidade de Chicago e o Fórum é uma instituição internacional que promove a discussão sobre a importância da competitividade para o progresso econômico, desenvolvimento econômico dos países. Thanks so much for, for being with us today. What does it mean for a country to be competitive? And, and why should governments be, be concerned about this? Absolutely. So the World Economic Forum produces since 1979 the Global Competitiveness Report, which is our benchmarking tool uh, monitoring competitiveness across the world. We define competitiveness as the set of factors and institutions that determine productivity in a country. And why is this important? Because productivity is the main factor determining growth, future income levels, and in general well-being. It's uh, the necessary, maybe not sufficient, but necessary condition for improvements in the well-being of people. Can you explain to us a bit how, how does it work? How, how does competitiveness um, uh, lead to, to, to economic progress? Absolutely. So uh, when we think about economic growth, you can grow because uh, you put more things into your production process or more capital, more workers, more labor, more land. Or you can grow because you start doing things differently, right? Better. You increase your productivity. You do more things with less. So that's why it's so important to figure out how to increase your productivity. And that's what competitiveness is. Competitiveness is all those conditions that allow you to do things better, to do things uh, uh, to produce more with less and get more out of your scarce resources. We, we've heard um, in, in the past decade, we, we got used to, to hear specialists, institutions such, such as the World Economic Forum, talk about how, how economic openness is an important driver of efficiency, efficiency and therefore growth in, on income levels. But recently, um, Apparently, there has been a, a popular response against this trend that many developed and, and emerging countries have embraced in the past decades uh, of opening their, their economies to, to global trade and investment. And some analysts have mentioned um, the exit of, of the United Kingdom from the European Union as an example of, of this response. Another one, more recent one, would be the, the election of Donald Trump in the United States with uh, basically an a anti-globalization discourse. Do, do you see this popular response as, as, as um, a sign that maybe globalization has failed to deliver um, economic prosperity to some uh, segments of, of society? Definitely, uh, I think that, uh, that, that it's clear that a globalization has had a distributional effect, but overall it's had, it's had a huge positive in, in, uh, impact globally, right? Uh, so if we look at the, the, the effects of uh, these globalization processes, we've seen millions of people uh, pulled out of poverty in China, in Asia, in India, as countries have uh, integrated, have uh, st started participating in the global economy. So overall, I think that uh, there has been a reduction in, in, in inequality as poverty has fallen, but there has been an increase in inequality within certain societies and certain countries. And that, I think that that's uh, the, the experience of some uh, industrialized countries such as the UK, the United States, where of course you have uh, shocks to certain professions, to certain occupations, to certain groups that tended to be producing some things that tend to, uh, to, to start being produced somewhere else, for instance. But the, the impact is very similar to the impact of, of uh, technology, right? So a new technology comes in and the effect is very similar to trade. Trade uh, dislocates uh, the production process just as te technology might. So uh, I think that, uh, that it, our challenge right now is to think about how we can protect the gains from globalization while addressing the pitfalls, right? Mm -hmm. And some of those, uh, those issues are the issues of uh, transitions, adjustment processes, uh, and how to, 
to address uh, the distributional aspects and the losers of, the, of, of those processes, right? Um, I think that that requires uh, a, a set of domestic policies that accompany these uh, foreign trade policies uh, to make, make it work for more people, right? Uh, and that links uh, very much into the competitiveness agendas that we think are important and that we advocate through our competitiveness work. Uh, in order to be able to benefit from openness, you have to have a, a competitiveness, uh, competitive conditions such as good institutions, good infrastructure, uh, adequate human capital, retraining, on-the-job training, health, uh, uh, technological uh, adoption and transfer. So all these conditions that allow you to benefit from trade. So well, uh, well-functioning markets, uh, labor markets that work, uh, uh, goods markets that work, uh, financial markets. So all these conditions uh, serve as a, a virtuous, to set in a virtuous cycle with openness uh, to generate incentives for innovation that in turn increase growth. And the more you have of these adequate conditions, the more people can actually benefit from these globalization processes. So I think that's it. the big issue is how can we improve our domestic policies to accompany our globalization and to make more people be able to benefit from it. Without doing this, so the, the risk is that globalization will continue to generate like this uh, imbalances income that, that you mentioned on income distribution. If Yes, so, so it's important to, to bear in mind that uh, the global income distribution has become less unequal, right? Mm -hmm. In some uh, countries within societies, you have uh, the big losers of uh, this globalization process, according to data from the World Bank, uh, have been the middle classes in the United States, in some places in Europe, right? So the middle classes have gained proportionately less uh, some of them, uh, it's not clear that they have lost, but they have won less. Uh, the big winners have been uh, the lower middle income classes in the emerging world and the global elites, right? So we have two clear groups of winners and one group of uh, very vocal uh, losers, of uh, relative losers at least, of this process uh, that were in manufacturing, for instance, that has been uh, vertically disintegrated and atomized uh, throughout uh, global value chains uh, and that uh, need adjustment processes and that need a set of uh, policies in terms of retraining of education, of better social safety nets maybe to address uh, those dislocations. So I think that, uh, that yes, uh, that there w is a big challenge in making it work for more people everywhere, right? But don't you think that, that w with these developments that, that uh, I, I mentioned the exit of the United Kingdom from the European Union, the election of, of Donald Trump in the US. Aren't we likely to see um, countries um, moving back a bit from the economic liberal liberalization? Well, that's one trend that we actually identified this year in the Global Competitors yeah, Report. Yeah, that's we true. Found, you mentioned this in, yes, in the latest report. Uh, that's uh, one of our three messages. Uh, we see over the past 10 years there's been a tendency a perception of less openness in terms of non-tariff barriers. So more regulations at the at customs, more in uh, rules and regulations to comply with, uh, more quality regulations, a whole bunch of non-tariff barriers that weren't there before. Uh, so uh, I think that there is a threat uh, that protectionism may come back. Uh, it was also a topic in the last G20 meetings. Uh, the G20 countries have implemented uh, more protectionist measures over the past five years than liberalizing measures. I think that, uh, that the challenge again is uh, to find ways to address these distributional concerns without losing on uh, the huge gains from globalizations, right? Uh, and I think that, that the emerging world has a big role to play here because they have been net winners in this process. Uh, we've seen a huge declines in poverty around the world over the last 20 years. Uh, and a lot of this is due to uh, this uh, larger participation in global markets. Do, can, do you think that we can expect emerging markets such as Asian countries to continue in this process of integration, even if developed countries before, uh, become like more, more closed? Uh, I think it is in their best interest for us to do it. It's very hard, uh, this protectionist wave 
it, it can be very damaging because the global value chains and chains are so uh, integrated and dispersed around the world. So, so the effects can be really bad. And these countries have a lot to gain from being integrated into it. it, it uh, we have to wait to see what happens. But for instance, with the TPP, the Trans-Pacific Partnership, uh, the biggest trade agreement uh, that, was, uh, with the, that was in the books, uh, now there has been some uh, signs that China would take the lead as the US uh, 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 draws out from the agreement. Uh, so I think that there are signs that, uh, that Asia, Asian countries that have benefited from these processes are willing to take the lead in, in furthering globalization and at least protecting free trade. Uh, there's also the Trade Facilitation Agreement at the WTO uh, with, that uh, is about to come into force. Uh, I think uh, there are only uh, less than, uh, than 10 countries uh, that, that have to ratify the agreement for it to, to, to come into force. And that's going to help with all these non-tariff barriers, right? Uh, but, uh, but again, I think that, uh, that, uh, that there's a challenge in highlighting the huge benefits globally from these processes, the big costs of going back, and of course, addressing the legitimate concerns of, uh, of constituents in advanced economies. Now, talking about Brazil, um, it's been very discouraging for, for us Brazilians who are concerned about uh, economic development to see year after year how Brazil um, has unfavorable positions in rankings such as the, the one that the World Economic Forum produces and other international rankings on the quality of um, secondary education or on the ease of doing business. And when, when, we consider, when we consider some aspects, some more like specific aspects such as the quality of overall infrastructure, the cost of crime, the position of, that Brazil has in, 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 in these rankings is, is even worse. Why do you think that has been so difficult for Brazil to make progress in recent years on these specific fronts? The first thing to recognize is that making progress on competitiveness requires making progress on all of these pillars simultaneously, right? All of these things are complements, are complementary, and they are very uh, coordination intensive, right? You need to coordinate within government, so you have to coordinate it between national government and regional governments. You have to coordinate it between the public sector and the private sector. So it's a, it's, it's a hard process to make progress in, right? That's the first thing to, 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 to note. So the first thing that, that, uh, that, uh, that you have to address is these coordination failures, right? You have to establish mechanisms to improve the coordination and the collaboration between government entities, so for instance, the Ministry of uh, Trade with the Ministry of Agriculture and the Ministry of Education. They all have to join forces to be able to improve competitiveness of the agricultural sector and increase agricultural exports, for instance, right? And, and all these issues usually require coordination between different uh, ministries, different agencies, and with your local governments and with the private sector. So addressing coordination is the first uh, main issue that, that has to be has to be in place. Um, the other issue is uh, uh, the complementarity, right? So uh, Brazil this year fell six positions in the Global Competitiveness Index, mainly driven by a big drop in the macroeconomic environment. And uh, Brazil is not unique in this aspect because uh, uh, we are facing the end of the commodity cycle, of the commodity boom. Uh, and with the drops in a lot of the products that Brazil exports, like oil, Brazil is a net uh, oil producer, uh, the fall in prices has resulted in a fall in the value of exports, in a fall in government revenues. Uh, it also resulted in a depreciation of, the, of, of our currencies. That depreciation fed into inflation, and all these things impacted the macroeconomic environment pillar of the index. This, in turn, deteriorates the competitiveness environment and makes it harder for new sectors to, to emerge, right? So what we need is a, a, for this fall in exports of oil, of agricultural products, of commodities, basically, to be replaced by new sectors. So we need innovation, right? We need new sectors to emerge to take over that, that space. And to do that, we need to address all these competitiveness issues, right? Technological transfer, 
a labor market performance, goods market performance, financial market, all those uh, different pillars. Actually, in the latest report, you, you highlight um, innovation, as you said, and progress, uh, communications, technology as like important new drivers of economic productivity. One question that, that I have is, how can my country, thinking again, for instance, uh, about Brazil, how can a country which hasn't made um, sufficient progress on basic, more basic things, such as the quality of infrastructure or education, make progress on innovation, for instance? Is, is it possible or do that's you have to follow some, some steps? Uh, yeah, that's a very interesting question. So the, currently, the, the Global Competitiveness Index has three sub-indices. One is the basic requirements, which is uh, infrastructure, institutions, macroeconomic stability, basic health and education. Then you have the efficiency enhancers, which are all the, the indicators of how markets work. And finally, you have business sophistication and innovation. The current thinking has kind of a stages of development concept embedded, where we think that we need the basic requirements, as you said, to be able to move on to innovation. But I think, uh, and, and we are, uh, we are re-evaluating re that position, we will launch uh, a, a new version of the, of the index next year, a uh, uh, Global Competitiveness Index 2.0, mm -hmm. uh, that it will likely drop that stages of a development concept. Because what we've seen is that uh, the fourth industrial revolution, this uh, a exponential increase in the use of technologies, uh, the convergence of all these technologies transforming the ways we consume, produce, uh, communicate, it will allow countries to leapfrog, probably, right? So there's a big possibility that we can make progress on competitiveness, investing in education, and skipping some of the steps that we thought were necessary before. So, so for, just, instance, yeah, for instance, a very concrete little uh, example from the index, uh, we still consider the number uh, of fixed telephone lines as an important infrastructure uh, factor. But what we've seen is that a lot of countries have stepped the fix, uh, have, uh, have skipped this uh, fixed line requirement and skip uh, into mobile straight away, right? Mm -hmm. Another uh, consideration, less concrete, but more, more like conceptually general, is that uh, all these new technologies and uh, ways of doing business can improve the way our institutions work, the way our governments work, the way uh, all this coordination between actors and the economy uh, materializes. Uh, so all this innovation and new technologies can actually improve the quality of education, the quality of institutions, the, uh, the availability of financial services, uh, the provision of infrastructure. So uh, it, there are like the, these virtual cycles between all these different components and innovation. Uh, not to say that you can make progress with only innovation, but innovation can, can help you make progress on, in other areas. But the, the, the key message uh, that we keep like, emphasizing year after year is that you really need comprehensive competitiveness agendas that address all of these aspects to be able to make sustainable progress. Can you give us like an example of a country which has been like developing and apparently addressing like all these questions that you mentioned at the same time, which, which has like... A, uh, being able to, to, to develop without, as you said, going through all the, the stage that you, we previously thought that were like necessary. An example of a country that is addressing this successfully well. So two, 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 two levels for, of, of, of response. Uh, one is that uh, the index, the benchmarking tools have been used in several countries as uh, the starting point for national competitiveness systems that address these, this coordination and articulation issues. So one example is Colombia that created mm -hmm. its national competitiveness system in 2006 with a private branch, a public uh, a sector coordination mechanism with a regional competitiveness council mechanism. So all these coordination mechanisms were set up in the national competitiveness agenda mm -hmm. uh, to, to be able to identify priorities to create agendas of work on specific issues, to coordinate with the private sector and, and make a progress there. Mm -hmm. Colombia has done a, 
has improved over the last 10 years, uh, uh, about eight positions, six, six to eight positions, I think. Uh, more recently, the Dominican Republic, so an island economy, small economy in the Caribbean, is also starting to build uh, active agendas uh, to, to start uh, leapfrogging in competitiveness. This year, they went up six positions, uh, and they just created, a, they're just starting to build their coordination mechanisms. Uh, and uh, we have lots of examples, interesting examples actually at the city level. So uh, maybe jumping into the thinking of cities as new focal points for competitiveness. We have cities that are starting to reinvent themselves using new technologies and repositioning them themselves, transitioning from cities that produced uh, big industrial uh, products like steel into new technology cities, right? So you have examples such as uh, Detroit, for instance, they're doing very interesting things, trying to, to climb out of their bankruptcy declared uh, some years ago and uh, reinventing the city. You have Bilbao. Bilbao is uh, in Spain. Mm -hmm. It's a nice example of a city that, uh, that used to be, uh, had to have a, a traditional big industrial base. And now they are reinventing themselves along uh, the, the lines of service economy, of technology-driven technology economy. You have uh, Dubai is a nice example of a city. Also, um, a, an oil exporting city that is also doing incredible things to reinvent itself. Uh, you have uh, uh, Monterrey in Mexico. That's another nice example where you had a big uh, steel industry, like big uh, tradition, uh, what, what you usually think about when you talk about industry, heavy 19th, 20th century industry. And they are reinventing themselves into uh, a technology and innovation hub. So you have interesting examples at the, at the city level. Is it more difficult for a big country like Brazil to do something similar to what Colombia has done, for instance? So uh, I think that the main issue is uh, the coordination issue, right? Coordination and information issues. Uh, so obviously in, uh, in bigger countries, uh, you have the challenge of coordinating between the national government and the regional governments. So that's why I see a lot of promise in these efforts that you have in Brazil of uh, uh, analyzing competitiveness at the city level, of creating these public-private collaborations between uh, uh, city-level governments and the private sector, all the work that Comunitas does, uh, uh, the Juntos uh, program, all those things uh, uh, I think are interesting ways of addressing these coordination issues at the city level. It's not a necessarily harder to make progress. Uh, I guess that, that the coordination issues could be, could be harder in, in, in bigger economies. Uh, but you also have uh, some advantages, right? So for instance, one of the of the key advantages that, uh, that Brazil has uh, in, in the competitiveness index is the, the huge market size, right? So smaller economies have to, ha have to integrate into the world economy in order to, to, to gain uh, economies of scale advantages, for instance. Brazil has a big uh, market that, uh, that, that you can leverage to, to, to gain uh, cost efficiencies, economies of scale to generate new sectors. When you mentioned the fact that, that Brazil um, has dropped in, in the index, uh, partly because of, of the macroeconomic the deterioration of mac the macroeconomic environment, you mentioned the end of the, the boom in the commodity cycle. What do you think about the conduction of, of macroeconomic policy itself? Did it play a role as well in, on these results? Well, we, we don't measure directly policies, right? So we measure the outcomes of those policies. So an increase in inflation, an increase in, in government debt, uh, uh, all this uh, driven by, by these international shocks, right? If there is a big challenge in addressing these issues through appropriate macroeconomic policies, but I think that one of the, of the messages of the report is that addressing these macroeconomic challenges it doesn't require only macroeconomic policy, but actually microeconomic policy. All these competitiveness issues that can help generate new growth engines, new growth sectors, can be a very effective response to things like current account deficits. That on the macro side, you could think of, of, of policies that reduce demand for foreign goods as a way to close that gap. The supply side response is no. Let's increase the competitiveness of the economy so that new sectors can emerge and fill that gap. So, so I think there, there's a, one of the key messages here is that 
we have to look beyond traditional macro policy, monetary policy, fiscal policy, exchange rate policies, and really look at all these different microeconomic and firm level issues. And do you, do you think that Brazil is sort of like trying to address these microeconomic policies? I think that there are interesting things happening. Actually, we'll have uh, some meetings uh, with the Ministry of Trade, of Science and Technology. They're all very interested in, in, uh, in collaborating with the forum and we'll start looking at, 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 at the competitiveness rankings and having some workshops. Uh, and I think that there, that there are very interesting things going on, interesting dialogues. I think that, uh, that, uh, a, that uh, one of the key issues is to use these diagnoses to generate these coordination mechanisms and to address uh, priorities, right? Mm -hmm. It's very important to, uh, there are so, ma so many topics and uh, uh, scarce resources, scarce political capital, scarce uh, time, basically, uh, that it's very important to, to identify key bottlenecks and to get the right people in the room, both from the government and from the private sector to address these, uh, these issues with very you know, coordinated and focalized uh, agendas. There are so many challenges in, in the case of Brazil that it seems like almost impossible to tackle all of them at the same time, right? Yes. But, uh, uh, but uh, we focused a lot on the, on the negatives, on, on the fall, but there were also interesting things where Brazil improved. So in uh, basic health and education, sure. there were improvements. There were improvements, very interestingly, in the institutions pillar, there were improvements in indicators measuring undue influence, ethics, and corruption, which sounds a little uh, ironic, right, in this context. Sure. But, but from our, our data and our results, uh, apparently there is a, a perception that uh, Brazil is tackling its institutional issues uh, on ethics, corruption, public sector uh, performance, and there are uh, signs of improvement uh, which I think uh, are, are a sign that, uh, that the things are being, uh, are being tackled, right? In the case of corruption and these ethical issues that you mentioned, um, the, the results that, that you measure are based on, on interviews. It's a, it's a survey, yeah. It's, it's a survey, a, it's a survey, with, a survey of, of uh, CEOs. Mm -hmm. Exec it's called the Executive Opinion Survey. So our, our index is based on two sets of data. Uh, what we call hard data, which is uh, indicators uh, from national statistics offices. And we have the executive opinion survey, which is conducted with uh, the help of partner institutes in each country, mm -hmm. uh, collecting, uh, filling in the gaps of a lot of this hard data that doesn't exist. And also uh, taking the thermometer of what business people are feeling uh, and seeing, which, uh, which uh, reflects on a true issues uh, that, uh, that are at the back of their minds when they make decisions about investment, uh, location, expansion, all the business decisions are based on how they perceive uh, things working. So yes, absolutely, we, we, we measure both things. S some, some Brazilian specialists have been highlighting, especially in, in, in recent years, they, they have been highlighting the fact that interest groups that, that capture like um, some benefits from, from the states, from, from governments, that, that these interest groups, they play a role on the postponement of reforms that would be important for, for increasing productivity, for instance. And, and, this, and this would be like a, a, a problem that's like more difficult to tackle because it's not a concrete problem such as um, a, a road that, that has like many holes, yeah. uh, if, if, you, if you understand what I mean. What's your take on this? I mean... Okay, absolutely no, that's a very good question. I think that the problem of special interest groups and the political economy of policymaking is central to these issues. And that's why uh, I think it's important to think about new ways to collaborate between the private sector and government. So uh, uh, some of the things that have, ha have happened in countries that start tackling competitiveness issues uh, in a comprehensive agenda is uh, starting these new structured dialogues with the private sector thinking about the long term, right? So, so you kind of uh, establish a new way of, uh, of uh, talking between government and the private sector where you don't talk with special interest groups about their short-term gains or losses, but you talk about it, the productive sector, the business sector as a whole, thinking about longer-term issues. Because productivity, uh, 
ultimately is a long-term issue, right? Sure. So, so once you establish that, that different dialogue and you change the, the tone of the dialogue, thinking about longer-term gains and, uh, and kind of the win-win space where everyone gains from things, those, those areas where, where there's no conflict between different groups, that's when you start making, making significant progress, right? So everyone, for instance, uh, would, would agree that having better uh, health and basic education will increase the productivity of, productivity of the workforce. And that's something that will benefit absolutely everyone, right? So those are the key issues that, uh, that, uh, where there, there will be no winners and losers within the, the business community. Danielle, thanks so much for being with us today. Thanks a lot. Uh, no, thank you for the invitation. Okay.